Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Have History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and last time we followed Johnston to the end of the war. Now I cover his post-war life. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. In the first few months after Johnston surrendered his forces to William T. Sherman at Bennett Place, Johnston stayed in the Greensboro area and looked for a job. He had been a soldier for around 35 years, and that was pretty much the only life he knew. His wife reached out to friends and family, attempting to secure her husband some kind of job to, as she put it, keep the kettle boiling. However, Lydia's health was failing. Johnston said that her health waned with the weather, and he grew ever more concerned about her health, knowing that he needed some kind of employment if he wanted to make sure she was taken care of. For a short time, he worked for the National Express and Transportation Company, then spent a year and a half working for the Alabama and Tennessee River Railroad Company later named the Selma, Rome, and Dalton Railroad. He found the job boring, and both him and Lydia were incredibly unhappy while he was president of the railroad. He finally found permanent employment and in insurance, working as an agent for the London-based Liverpool and London and Globe Insurance Company. After visiting the home office in England, Johnson returned to the United States, set up his home office and the branch of the company named Joseph E. Johnson & Company, where he oversaw the parent company's southern department. His company was profitable, presiding over 120 agents in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. He and Lydia, for her health, spent summers in Warm Springs, Virginia, hoping to reap the benefits of the mineral springs there. Now that Johnston found permanent employment as an insurance agent, he had time to work on his memoirs in an attempt to defend his wartime record. He wrote to corps and division commanders, except Hood, asking them to send him papers, or even better, write reminiscences of the war. When those men didn't satisfy his questions, he prodded them to reconsider sections that didn't align with his way of viewing the war, particularly the Atlanta campaign. Hood wasn't Johnson's only target. Johnson wanted Jefferson Davis to take a large portion, if not all, of the blame for the defeat of the Confederacy. But there was a problem. Davis's imprisonment at Fort Monroe for about two years created a martyr to the Confederate cause, and people began to look at the former president differently than they had during the war. Wade Hampton, Johnson's cavalry commander in North Carolina at the tail end of the war, wrote to Johnson asking for a letter of recommendation to the Viceroy of Egypt to hopefully be named an officer in that army, like other Confederates did. Hampton knew that Johnson was attacking Davis publicly, but thought that hurt the unity of the South in the post-war years. He wrote to Johnston, I feel sure no good can come in any way by any publication by you raising an issue on the point. Any controversy between Mr. Davis and yourself would jar upon the feelings of thousands who are friendly to both of you and would tend to throw discredit on our cause. Do not allow yourself to be drawn into any personal altercation. Johnson's book was published in 1874 entitled Narrative of Military Operations Directed During the Late War Between the States. Through his dry narrative of his Civil War career, Johnston attacked Davis on multiple topics, including Davis ranking Robert E. Lee, Samuel Cooper, and Albert Sidney Johnston higher than himself within the Confederate military. Unfortunately for Johnston, others saw the attack as petty, especially since Lee had become such a beloved figure in the minds of Southerners. His section on Vicksburg was particularly confusing because he insisted that Theophilus Holmes in Arkansas possessed 55,000 men, and if he and Pemberton had just linked up, then they could have defeated Ulysses S. Grant outright. Holmes, from most estimates, numbered his army at around 10,000 but Johnson never would accept that Holmes didn't have a larger force. Included in the book was a line-by-line -line rebuttal to the message Davis wrote but never submitted to the Confederate Congress, outlining his problems with putting Johnson in command of the Army of Tennessee at the end of the war. The book sold poorly, and the publisher lost money, and Johnson alienated many people by blaming them. One of Johnson's biographers wrote about the publication that, By 1874, many of the southern states had been redeemed, returned to home rule, what Southerners wanted to remember about the war was their devotion and sacrifice, not their mistakes, whoever made them. They wanted to believe that their soldiers had been heroic, their generals cunning and bold, their government supportive and determined. The principal theme of the Southern literature on the war was that the South had been overwhelmed by superior numbers. Most were perfectly willing to believe that all their leaders had been heroes. The book's poor reception was a disappointment to Johnston. 
Years later, when a prospective biographer wrote to ask him to bless his project, the old general warned him that the public was not interested and prophesied that the publication would be a dead loss. Not only did Johnston attack Davis, he attacked Hood to a great degree. But by the time Johnston's book came out, Hood's Tennessee campaign was universally understood as a complete failure. Johnston's attacks didn't lower Hood's standing, but Hood also wrote his own book called Advance and Retreat. In it, Hood believed Johnston had ruined the Army of Tennessee before he ever took command of it by retreating and losing more soldiers than he actually reported in the Atlanta campaign. Unfortunately for Johnston, Hood died in 1879, the same year Hood's book came out. In death, Hood had eluded facing Johnston's rebuttal. In 1877, Davis's book, The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, was published. But try as he might, Johnston couldn't really find any attack on himself. Davis focused most of his attention on the legality of secession and politics rather than the military. Davis had defeated Johnston again, this time by not engaging with the general. On a train ride from Savannah, Georgia to Richmond, Virginia, Johnston had a deep and lengthy conversation with Frank A. Burr that continued once they got to the city. Burr was a reporter for the Philadelphia Press, and he asked Johnston questions about the end of the war. One of the questions was what happened to the Confederate gold reserves. Johnston claimed that only $179,000 worth was accounted for out of the $2 million that was in the reserves. Johnston also stated that Davis never did give a satisfactory answer to where it went. Burr ran the story on December 18, 1881, with the headline, Confederate Gold Missing. General Johnston called Jefferson Davis to account for over $2 million in specie. Davis was angered by the accusation, and it only made people feel sorry for Johnston, who they saw as more pathetic in his assertions. Davis was so disgusted by Johnston's statements and actions that he refused to come to the dedication of a statue to Robert E. Lee because Johnston was the president of the Lee Memorial Association. The editors of Century Magazine wanted Johnston to write an article for their publication, and Johnston accepted. Using the article to rebut many of Davis's accusations, Johnston denounced that Davis was on the battlefield at First Manassas as the battle was taking place. But his most volatile section of the article didn't pertain to Davis. It was the Battle of Seven Pines. First, Johnston quoted the initial casualty list made by the combatants instead of using the corrected numbers that both sides later reported. When the editors corrected his numbers, he was adamant that the numbers remained the way he recounted them, despite them being wrong. They settled on adding a footnote to include the real casualty numbers. Second, Johnston didn't like the map published with the article about Seven Pines. The map showed the Union position as one line instead of two sections, which he thought made his plan outlined in the article look foolhardy. The editors used the map, but did include an explanation that the map depicted the Union battle line after the attacks. Johnston met with one of the editors, Robert Johnson, in the lobby of the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York City and argued with him, raising his voice and yelling at the editor. As with many of his temper flare-ups, Johnston felt bad afterwards and apologized to the man. One of Johnston's biographers explained that Johnston's behavior contrasted markedly with that of his old classmate, Robert E. Lee, who adopted a dignified silence about all questions concerning the war. Lee wrote no memoir and even refused interviews on the subject. Because Lee accepted full public responsibility for all his actions, the public concluded that he was not responsible at all, and his quiet stoicism elevated him to southern sainthood after his death in 1870. By contrast, Johnson's continued insistence that he was not at fault led many to assume he was probably guilty. In the years after the war, Joe Johnston became the father figure of the family, even though he wasn't the oldest living brother of the family. His older brother Peter was stricken with ill health and poverty. When Joe's nephew, John W. Johnston, informed his uncle that Peter was sick and alone in the house at Abingdon, Joe hired a man to stay with Peter and help him. Joe also secured Peter a job under a local attorney, but Joe paid his brother's salary, unbeknownst to Peter, because Peter wouldn't take charity. When his brother Beverly died, Joe and the rest of the family agreed to sell the estate in Abingdon. He put Peter up in a hotel and rented the room for him. When a family member wanted to name their son Joe after him, the old general asked for an act of kindness and not name a child Joe because it is a name unbecoming of a gentleman and something he himself had suffered with throughout his life. Johnson began to show great interest in politics when the Hawaiian Reciprocity Treaty came to the floor of Congress, which would allow a custom-free exchange of agricultural goods 
between the United States and the Kingdom of Hawaii, Johnson wrote to his nephew in the Senate, asserting that this would hurt southern planters who grew sugar and rice. His nephew voted against the treaty, but it passed anyway. In the election of 1876, the volatile election garnered Johnson's attention also. When Tilden resigned himself to defeat at the hands of Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican candidate, Johnston thought Tilden should have fought harder to be president. He wrote, If he had the heart of a dunghill hen, he would have claimed the presidency and been inaugurated. It is as certain as any matter of opinion that if he had been resolute, he would have been backed by the whole Democrat Party, against which Grant would not have attempted to use his little military force. The winter of 1876 to 77 saw Johnston and Lydia move to Richmond, Virginia. In 1878, the local Democratic committee approached him to run for the U.S. Congress. Johnson said he would if he didn't have to campaign, that he wanted it to be presented to him by the will of the people, and his acceptance would be his duty. They assured him that he wouldn't have to canvass, but this was false, and Johnson didn't like having to sell himself to all classes of people. He felt that his name and reputation should speak for itself. His biggest opponents were greenbackers, who promised a cheap money policy. Johnston believed this was a false promise and saw the election as good versus evil. Johnston blamed what he called the carpetbagger government, which forced the planting class to borrow heavily against their crops, sending them into debt. In this way, the greenbackers appealed to not only the formerly wealthy, but also the poor. Johnston campaigned hard to discredit the greenbackers, insisting that cheap money to the people would also be cheap money to the creditors. But as November drew near, he feared that he hadn't been able to convince the public. Johnston did win the election and became congressman. However, his time in Congress was uneventful. He was on the Committee of Military Affairs, and in that role he visited West Point, but he rarely spoke on the House floor. Disillusioned with politics, he decided not to run for another term. The election of 1880 saw two Union generals face off for the presidency, Republican James A. Garfield and Democrat Winfield Scott Hancock. Johnston believed that Hancock was one of the last hopes for the Democratic Party to gain a foothold in national politics, but when Hancock was defeated, Johnston was distraught. When Democrat Grover Cleveland won the presidency in 1884, Johnston's name was on the list for being Secretary of War, but Cleveland's advisors thought better, thinking that the nation wouldn't accept the former rebel in that position. So Cleveland named Johnston the U.S. Railroad Commissioner. It would be his job to inspect the rail lines across the United States. Every summer, he would crisscross the nation to write his report on the status of the railroads. Most of the time, he traveled 200 miles a day by rail for his inspections. He never wanted an idle life, and this kept him on his feet in his old age. On February 22, 1887, Lydia passed away at the age of 65. Johnston was devastated and couldn't bring himself to write or speak her name afterward. He was too heartbroken. He compensated for the heartache by working harder, but in 1888, Cleveland was defeated by Union veteran Benjamin Harrison, and Johnston was removed from his position as commissioner. Johnston blamed the Republican victory on that party's assembling of black voters at the polls, and he feared that by the Republicans using black voters that the Democratic Party would never regain dominance. When his time in the government was over, he retired to his home on Connecticut Avenue in Washington, D.C. In his retirement, Atlanta, Georgia was set to unveil a Confederate monument, and Johnson was invited to come take part in the ceremony. He shared an open carriage with one of his former staffers and fellow Confederate general, Edmund Kirby Smith. As the carriage rode slowly by a crowd, a soldier said, That's Johnston! That's Joe Johnston! Then a massive crowd surrounded the carriage. Hands and arms extended into the carriage to shake the general's hand. The horses pulling the carriage were unhitched, and the old veterans of the Army of Tennessee pulled Johnston's carriage to the ceremony site. Tears came streaming down the old general's face, realizing that the men still loved him for what he did for them. At the unveiling of the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond, Johnston became part of the ceremony, helping to unveil the statue of his friend. All kinds of visitors came to visit with him in the post-war years, when many of his fellow Confederates turned their backs on him. Union veterans praised him. Both Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman, and especially Sherman, acknowledged the great abilities of Johnston, and those two became good friends. In 1885, he was actually one of the pallbearers for Grant's funeral, and he also performed that task for his pre-war friend and wartime adversary, George B. McClellan. In 1891, Johnson traveled to New York to be a pallbearer for his friend, Sherman, 
It was a cold and wet February day when they laid the Union General to rest, and Johnston mourned with his head uncovered. Someone told him to put his hat on to keep him from catching a cold, but he said, If I were in his place and he were standing here in mine, he would not put on his hat. Johnston did catch a cold, and it got progressively worse. The old general had labored breathing, which lasted weeks. His brother-in-law, Robert McLean, sat with him every evening until Johnston went to sleep. On March 21, 1891, as McLean left Johnston's home on his way back to his own house, Russell, Johnston's black attendant, came running to McLean saying that Johnston was failing. McLean rushed back over to Johnston's home, and at a few minutes past eleven, Johnston passed away. Some of the first callers to Johnston's home for visitation were two Union generals, William S. Rosecrans and John M. Schofield. After the funeral, Johnston's body was laid to rest in Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore, Maryland, next to his wife Lydia. Joseph E. Johnston was a leader of men, as exhibited by inspiration instilled in the Confederate troops on the First Manassas Battlefield and the loyalty of the Army of Tennessee to him. Despite not winning many major victories, his troops loved him and would do what they could for him. Johnston's first objectives when he took command of troops was to get them fed and equipped, and the men loved him for it. They trusted him despite his retreats. Yes, indeed, Johnston gave up a lot of ground as commander of various Confederate forces. His lack of aggression is legendary, and his search for perfection of a situation or plan hindered his fighting ability. His temper got the better of him on many occasions with subordinates and superiors, particularly Davis. If he felt slighted, Johnston never could forget the attack, and most famously went on the attack verbally and through the written word to regain his honor. Johnston's contemporaries and historians have and still debate the merits and failures of Johnston's withdrawals across the southern landscape. To a certain degree, the retreats were understandable, but how far could one retreat, waiting on the right opportunity to strike? For some, it seemed like he would never strike. Part of it was his opponent in the Atlanta campaign, William T. Sherman. Sherman didn't want to launch headlong assaults against an entrenched enemy and resolved to flank Johnston, avoiding battle. Nevertheless, he did delay the Union general. Although there was blame to go around to all parties, President Davis, Braxton Bragg, Judah Benjamin, and John Bell Hood made life difficult for Johnston. Sometimes he brought it on himself, and other times he didn't. But he never could let a grudge die and he spent many of his post-war years trying to reclaim his name, a name that was beloved by the men who served under him. Sam Watkins of Company H of the 1st Tennessee Infantry said it best, Such a man was Joseph E. Johnston, and such his record. Farewell, old fellow. We privates loved you because you made us love ourselves.